He's the lovable chameleon cowboy who found himself in the high desert after his terrarium fell out of a car. He has a hat, he plays golf, he's got the voice of Edward Scissorhands. Try me. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Ra Oh, 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 Durango. Boy, that made a lot more sense. It's the tough-as-nails SUV that feels right at home in a suburban neighborhood, on a dirt road, and flying down the drag strip. It's the do-it-all utility vehicle that's named after a city in Colorado, Mexico, and Iowa. Saddle up, you sack of taters. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Dodge Durango. I know James was here last week, but obviously all that stuff happened. He shot those ahead of time, and he's doing okay now. So that's why I'm here this week, to fill you in on some new stuff from Dodge. Times were simpler in the late 90s. Bruce Green had just graduated high school. A young tattoo artist named William Frederick Durst was revolutionizing both rap and rock and combining them. Also, smaller SUVs had secured a foothold in the American market. SUVs filled mall parking lots as suburban and city boomer parents were digging on their benefits. Ford was killing it with sales of the Explorer, and even Lexus found a sweet spot with the RX 300. Dodge wanted to get on the action too. They had built the big, brooding two-door Ram Charger for quite a while already. Ram, Ram Charger. Charger! It was essentially a scrunched up Dodge Ram with a hat on the bed, so it was a pretty thick ride, thick with two C's. But the fact that it was quite huge, quite thirsty, and only had two doors meant that it wouldn't be a good candidate to turn into a mainstream SUV. I mean, you saw what happened with the Bronco. <coughs> OJ. <coughs> Dodge needed something more nimble and more efficient, and something that could still do sturdy body-on-frame truck things. The development team looked across the lineup for something they could work with. What about the Avenger? Nah. That wouldn't be rugged. Grand Caravan? Nah, that was a transverse front-wheel drive platform. There just had to be something that struck a balance between the ability to haul big loads and the maneuverability to park the dang thing. What did they have that could do that? Oh, there was the very successful mid-sized Dakota pickup, but what if they threw more seats in it, put a roof on it, and gave it the contemporary new Dodge corporate design language? Then maybe they could ram their way past the Ford Explorer on the sales chart. Ha ha ha! Ram! I didn't write this. <laughs> the all-new Dodge Durango launched with the 1998 model year. It was bigger than its competition too, just not as huge as the massive Chevy Tahoes and Ford Expeditions. It was advertised with various wise-cracking punny commercials, and the bad guy from the Lost Boys did the voiceover. Gonna lose his wimpy toe in blue. It was the memorable New Dodge era, which blessed American TV screens with all kinds of wild and super 90s commercials. The Durango was marketed as a mid-size SUV and went up against the likes of the Ford Explorer and Toyota 4Runner, with its showpiece being a tough body-on-frame truck with street, particularly suburban street, sensibilities. Dodge's Dakota, which the Durango was based on, was at home in the cornfields, while the Durango was at home in the soccer fields. Though, if your Tupperware slinging suburban mom had to take you and six of your traveling soccer teammates to face off against kids in a small rural town, it would have no issue fording a washed out country road to get there. Yeehaw! <laughs> just like adjustable rate mortgages, suburban boomers ate them up in the late 90s. And it wasn't just thanks to smart advertising and Edward Herman, it walked the frickin' walk, too. The Durango had some of the best in-class cargo room and a third row of seats that was remarkably easy to operate. It also had one of the nicest interiors in its price range. Because of all of this, the Durango sold very, very well. The first-gen Durango came with either a V6 or a variety of V8s, rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, and had the highest towing capacity in its class at around 7,500 pounds. The 5.2-liter Magnum V8 was the most popular power plant option, but the big 5.9-liter Magnum V8 that came in the RT made 245 horses and 330 pound-feet of torque. It was the most powerful engine in its class, and it sounded badass with an exhaust system, by the way. Listen to this. Woo! The hottest OG Durango was the Shelby SP360. That's right, an SUV tuned by none other than Carol friggin' Shelby! Naturally, it had some awesome stats to do the name proud. Under its huge hood was the 5.9 liter Magnum V8 with a supercharger strapped to it, and some more power baby internal magic done to make 360 horsepower and 412 pound-feet of daddy tickling torque.
What the hell is daddy tickling? Daddy tickling? What the hell is daddy tickling torque? I can't even say it. All this power made the 4,600 pound four door truck claw its way to 60 miles per hour in 6.7 seconds. <laughs> very fast for its time. It also had a cool ass body kit, racing stripes, tuned suspension, massive brakes, all four corners, and a sportier interior with a boost gauge. Super sick. People didn't say that in the 90s though. Sick means cool. But once we got firmly into the mid 2000s, it was time to give the old sturdy bird a ground up refresh with even tougher styling, more power, and buff stats. Enter the second generation Durango in 2004. Designed by Chrysler design manager turned sneaker sketcher Aaron Pizzuti, the styling was revised to match the new Millennium Dodge design language. The Durango looked bigger and badder, it sat higher, and naturally retained the quintessential Dodge crosshair front grille. Because this big buff boy had gone to the gym and done a bunch of reps, it was now competing with full-size SUVs like the Chevy Tahoe and Ford Expedition. It was still body on frame too, so it kept that rugged, built to overcome all BTE or big truck energy for the people that are following with memes from two years ago. Sorry, I'm burning up the writer, I apologize. <laughs> Dodge maintained the concept of having a truck that was easy to manage on suburban streets. And the engines got stronger too. In fact, the Durango was graced with one of the most iconic engines of all time, the Hemi. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Oh, I only got one. <laughs> Between 2004 and 2008, the Hemi made 335 horses and 370 pound-feet of torque. Later, it was tuned up to pump out a healthy 360 horsepower and 401 pound-feet of torque. Not bad at all, especially considering they could only make similar numbers in the previous gen with the supercharged Shelby. This whole thing was good for 0 to 60 in 7.4 seconds. Dodge added some more specialized models with the Adventurer and Limited trims. The Adventurer was introduced to make it more off-road capable, and the Limited was meant to compete with rival luxury trim levels. It went up against similarly specced Explorers, Sequoias, and Tahos. The buff book CarMag journalists considered it a very worthy competitor for less money. Nice work, Dodge. <laughs> The second gen Durango was refreshed in 2007, becoming a tad more sleek and continued in production until 2009. After a two year hiatus, it was time to reinvigorate the SUV market with some fresh, clean design. Dodge debuted the third generation Durango in 2011. Once again designed by Aaron Pizzuti, it looks more muscular yet more slender and athletic than the previous generation. Kind of like it's been listening to the Joe Rogan experience a lot and decided to invest in a bunch of supplements and start flipping over truck tires and playing jump rope. It also has a blue belt in jujitsu. To stay on pace with the more recent trend of having a crap ton of options, packages, and trim levels, the customization level of the current Durango is higher than ever. About half of them come standard with the modern bad Chrysler Pentastar V6, one of Dodge's most powerful V6s ever, with cylinder deactivation, the ability to run E85, and other miles per gallon friendly developments. And you better believe you can still get them with a Hemi. Dodge doubled down on hiding a muscle car and SUV clothing, and there are now two different Hemi options. They're both screaming fast, of course, but one screams just a little faster. James destroyed no one in a drag race with it. <laughs> I'm the fastest man alive! <laughs> ow, ow, ow! And no one will never live it down. He is mocked to this day. It's really sad. It's the Durango SRT, and it's stacked with a 6.4 liter Hemi that stomps out a massive 475 horsepower and 470 pound-feet of gut-punching torque. It's the most powerful three-row SUV in America. The amazement does not stop there. The angry, snarling, buff Clydesdales gallop to 60 miles in just 4.4 seconds. That's faster than a Honda Civic Type R, and it can haul 8,700 pounds the Type R definitely cannot do that. I've tried, tore off the back axle. Its modern unibody construction means the suspension can be tuned for more street and track precision and grip. It's also a bargain for the performance and versatility. Its chassis mate, the Mercedes AMG GLS 63, is only marginally faster and costs over $120,000. This bad boy, the highest Durango trim, sets you back only around 70 grand. Not bad. Thanks to Dodge for sponsoring this episode of Up to Speed, and don't worry, there are a lot of Durangos that can be had for way less than 70,000. Even starting out, the V6 SXT can tow 6,200 pounds and comes with 18-inch satin carbon aluminum wheels. You climb that trim ladder and there are more perks like a heated steering wheel, heated first and second row seats, and that all-important third row. The looks get more aggressive too, and way more badass. The GT upgrades to a 20-inch wheels, and the GT Plus gets stripes, and you know stripes always make you faster. I put them on my Camaro, and it made it faster. But don't make me prove it. <laughs>
The Citadel trim covers the seats in sweet Napa leather and throws a flashy dual exhaust out the back. The RT puts the 5.7 liter Hemi under the hood, along with a sportier handling and a premium stereo. But you know, you want the SRT with that 6.4 liter Hemi V8, Brembo six piston brakes, and black 20 inch wheels. It's got all wheel drive too, Bilstein active suspension, and can still haul a best in class 8,700 pounds. That's the one James drove. That's definitely the one I want. Sometimes watching your favorite YouTube channel just isn't enough and you want to wear a shirt with your favorite YouTube channel's name on it. Well, good news, we're dropping all kinds of new stuff for the holidays so you can give that D-hole in your life a special present. Even if you're the special D-hole in your life, get yourself something. You deserve it. Treat yourself. Thank you very much for watching your substitute teacher, Mr. Bruce Green. That's me. Leave a comment below. James is recovering well. He will probably be back back he will probably be back next week. Actually, I know he'll be back next week. And a message from the legendary James Pumphrey. I love you. Yay. Oh man, that's so much fun.